I'm going to talk to you about mechanisms of culture change, in general about what is common to how cultures have changed in the past, and specifically about suggestions on how to change certain problematic things about our current culture. I'd like to tackle the problem of culture change with the help of evolutionary biology. Long before DNA was found to be the physical locus of genetic information, or even discovered, the concept of a gene as a replicable unit of biological information proved useful. An analogous concept to gene is that of meme, a replicating unit of cultural information. We do not yet have a neat physical locus for memes. Unlike genes, they seem to be able to inhabit many physical locations. They are more software than hardware. Like genes, memes are identified by their effects on people and cultures. There is a further similarity. The products of genes organize themselves cooperatively to form specialized organelles, specialized cells, specialized organs, specialized organisms, species, and so forth. Different types of cells in an organism contain the same genes. The difference between cell types consists in how those genes are linked together in a network, or how they are regulated. Different species in the same genus also contain mostly the same genes. The biggest variation among them is not genetic, but structural, in how the genes interact at the gene network level. Similarly, memes form networks within networks of increasing levels of organization. The differences between cultures, religions, technologies, and paradigms are mostly about the structure of networks, not so much about their component memes. Sometimes new memes are introduced or changed to build new networks, but most of the basic memes used to build those networks change a little. It's the interactions among genes or memes that matter most. The process of changing a meme network is similar to the process of biological speciation. It's hard. There are many failures. For example, here is a list of failed attempts taken mostly from the late social critic Paul Goodman. Perhaps we can save energy and heartbreak by studying this process both in nature and culture so we can learn what works and what doesn't. In order to understand the process of speciation or culture change, we have to introduce the evolutionary concept of a fitness landscape. Picture a regular landscape with mountains and valleys. Our species is analogous to a ball that moves under the influence of gravity, seeking the bottom of the closest valley. In addition to gravity, it is powered by random jittery motion. The height of the landscape represents negative fitness. I could have chosen the height to represent fitness, and then the ball would seek the top of the closest mountain. But valleys are more comfortable than mountain tops, and gravity points downhill, so to keep this analogy intuitive, I let the height represent negative fitness. That is, the greatest fitness is in the valleys and the least fitness is on the mountaintops. I haven't told you what the horizontal directions are and what is the meaning of distance. I drew only one horizontal direction in the lower diagram and the upper picture has two, whereas genetic landscapes have millions of horizontal directions. There are many ways to define these directions and distances along them, and I won't get much into the details of it for the purposes of this presentation. For simplicity, just think of them as changes in genes. The position of the ball is an average over the population. One individual changing in a large population makes very little difference to the position of the ball, but a large difference in a small population. There are conservative forces that try to prevent genetic changes and maintain the status quo, and there are radical forces that try to promote genetic change. The gradient of the fitness function, analogous to gravity, can be conservative if the species tries to climb out of its current valley, but it can be radical if a species makes it to a mountain pass, whereupon it can roll down to another valley. There is a radical force of random mutations which can allow the ball to move either up or down the fitness gradient. And there is a radical force of drift, which allows the frequency of mutations in a population to increase or decrease in a well-defined but probabilistic way with each new generation. Because of drift and mutation, the position of the ball depends not only on gravity and the shape of the landscape, but it has a jittery random nature which increases as the size of the population or ball decreases. Note that there are large fitness and other barriers between species. Otherwise, we would see frequent spontaneous speciation events. It is not just a matter of time. Why are there large obstacles to speciation? The first barrier or obstacle I will talk about is actually not a fitness barrier. 
It's a conservative force that tries to prevent and eliminate mutations and maintain genomic, genomic stability. There are a whole slew of genes and proteins that are in charge of repairing or eliminating DNA, DNA damage, regardless of whether that damage results in a beneficial mutation or not. This is generally a good thing, ensuring stability when things are working. The cultural analogy is that of police, media, and education. Most of these institutions try to maintain the status quo of the memome. The way nature and culture deal with this is to increase the number of mutations when there is stress and change is desirable. It's a good thing that though these conservative mechanisms can be highly sophisticated and powerful, they aren't perfect or we would never be able to affect change when we need to. Another obstacle to change is genetic or mimetic drift. I've already mentioned drift and the fact that it becomes harder to incorporate a new gene the larger the size of the population. A good explanation of genetic drift can be found on Wikipedia. It has to do with the fact that each new organism in a sexually reproducing species gets half its genes from the mother and half from the father and new mutations can be diluted. Drift generalizes to non-sexual reproduction and even so-called horizontal gene or meme transfer which is the main mechanism of meme transfer in cultures. The main prerequisite for drift is dilution of information with some transfers. The idea that the Earth revolves around the Sun was actually able to displace the idea that the Sun and other heavenly bodies revolve around the Earth, though at first it was almost drowned out by sheer numbers from the opposition. The way to counter drift is with reproductive or mimetic isolation in small groups. One can argue that this is what happened when science diverged from the Church, or when, or when Christianity diverged from Judaism and Paganism. Most evolutionary biologists, for the sake of simplicity, maintain that speciation is synonymous with reproductive isolation. I differ. I maintain that reproductive isolation is a necessary but not sufficient step in speciation, which includes large morphological change, testable, either in the lab or with simulations. Two populations that are isolated reproductively and subject to different selective pressures will not diverge much unless something else happens which I will get to shortly. Hegel was correct that sometimes there is conflict between meme networks that get synthesized and worked out, but not when one meme network is much more replicated, replicating and powerful than another. Marcuse analyzed how capitalism incorporates any serious opposition, and this generalizes to complex systems such as species and cultures. The system will eat you up unless you achieve some measure of isolation. It will also make isolation seem unappealing by calling isolated communities with pejorative names like cult. The next obstacle to speciation is actually due to a fitness barrier, but it isn't just fitness relative to an external environment. It is mostly fitness of a new gene or meme relative to the network of which it is a part. This concept is being argued strongly and correctly by intelligent design people and the defenses offered by mainstream evolutionary biologists are not always complete. The point is that once a network is functional, it is hard to make small incremental changes to it that actually work. If that, if that network is, an individual and perf is in an individual and performing essential tasks, task, small changes could result in death or at least inability to propagate the mutation before death. This is easily seen even with a simple network composed of only five parts which comprise the mousetrap shown here. To change the mousetrap in an incremental and random way and still have it work as a mousetrap seems impossible. All five parts would have to change in tandem. Or a new part would have to be introduced which works with the rest of the network, but then there won't be much morphological change. The way nature and culture overcomes this obstacle is by way of master genes and memes. Master genes and memes are genes and memes that control and regulate many other genes and memes in a network. Changing a master meme therefore is a change in one gene or meme that can be done in an evolutionarily incremental way but the effect is large since it affects many other genes and memes not by mutating them but by changing the structure of the network of which they are a part or creating a whole new network out of already existing parts. Master genes and memes allow natures and cultures to find a direction of a mountain pass which, though still a barrier, is the lowest barrier. Actually, as we will see later, sometimes there is no fitness barrier at all to small changes in a master meme. 
Before we look more at master, before we look more at master genes and memes, let's first see other examples of gene and meme networks. Here is a gene network that was mapped not too long ago by molecular biologists. It is only one network among thousands, which also interact among themselves. Here is a hypothetical master gene that controls lung development and evolution from fish to mammals. Here is a one method of arranging and regulating genes and memes that is very useful both for homeostasis and change is in a hierarchy. This is useful not only in the military, corporations or government bureaucracies, but in computer science and any time a group of people or concepts needs to be organized. A master meme can include much information and function by organizing many other memes into a network, but other memes do not need to know the details of that network in order to interact with this meme. A bunch of master memes can be grouped together and regulated by higher level master meme, and so on. In Lord of the Rings, Tolkien mentions that although there was one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them. The other rings were not about domination but harmonious organization of the races or cultures. Hierarchy is itself a master meme, but it doesn't necessarily imply a hierarchy of people. I want to talk more about master genes and memes. This concept has come to us from embryology and developmental biology. Notice the picture of caterpillars turning into butterflies. A few master genes were found that control body morphology during embryogenesis and also during uh, the stages of insects like butterflies in that mutating them but not other genes can make large changes to morphology. This suggests a functional way to determine whether a gene or meme is a master gene or also shown on the left are hypothetical master memes needed to maintain the meme network called Empire. A strong military, an industrial technology, a cheap source of energy, a hierarchy of power and control, a strong propaganda machine, an ability to accumulate large amounts of wealth, and a desire to consume without limit. Perhaps these are not all master memes. Because of mimetic drift and the fact that memes like genes are internal, we can't do the experiment of removing or altering one of them, except in our minds or in a more or less isolated culture. There is one big difference between genes and memes which I alluded to earlier, whereas it is not always true that higher order biological structures are under master gene control, e.g. there is no master gene for a cell. It is always possible to create a master meme to at least describe a meme network, if not control it. Memes can thus be found not only in our minds, but in our cultural artifacts such as technology, architecture, clothes, food, and organizations. It's clear to me that the president is not a high-level master meme. Changing the president does not alter empire very much. Changing the nature of political control would change empire, and centralized political control is a master meme. The money meme is debatable because if money was replaced by some other quid pro quo accounting system, empire could still continue, though less efficiently. Some, like Jacques Ellul, claim that it is the abstract nature of money, its propensity to concentrate in the hands of a few, and its power over us that makes it a master meme. Jesus called it mammon, master meme money. But note again, it is not the rich or the master meme but money itself. Consumerism, though a master meme, seems under control of other master memes, like centralized industrial and economic production. Here is a meme network which I mapped in a very sketchy, suggestive, and unscientific way. It is easy to see that changing any of the memes on the periphery won't make much change to the network. They are not master memes, 
or at least not high-level master memes. Whereas changing some of the master memes at the interior or introducing new ones might change the whole network. The genes at the interior are master memes or sometimes can be master meme networks that are not shown in detail. Those at the periphery are not. Here's another meme network, one that doesn't exist yet except in my mind and the mind of a few others and perhaps in certain isolated communities. Although I didn't draw them in the previous slide, the memes on the exterior are mostly in existence already in the mainstream meme networks that I showed previously, either in mutated form or not. In the mainstream network, they are either not functional or connected in a different way. If a meme in this diagram exists in the mainstream network and is not connected there, or if it doesn't exist in the mainstream network, connecting it to that network won't work. It has low fitness relative to the internal network environment. Some of the memes in the new network are small mutations of memes in the old network, but most are exactly the same. The way to get from one network to another is not mutations in the memes on the periphery, but one or a few mutations in the master memes of the interior, which affects a reconnection of the memes that already exist in the mainstream network. Completely new master memes and networks can also be created, but, also, but almost no new memes are necessary. This was seen by Buckminster Fuller in his famous quote about not trying to change a system, but building another one that makes the old one obsolete. Here are two master memes, love and inner work. They don't fit very well within the meme network we call empire, and so have almost been eliminated through the mechanisms discussed previously. Though they persist in Christian and Buddhist communities that offer some degree of cultural isolation, Inner work is a, rec a recognition that meme networks are found in our minds and hearts, not only in external networks, that the external ones have partially the same structure of our internal ones, are not only a part of the external ones, but a self-similar reflection of them, and that we have more control over our internal networks than the external ones, so it is strategically wise to work on changing our internal networks before attempting to change the external ones. However, Though necessary, changing the internal ones is not enough to change the external ones. Without cultural isolation and changing the external master memes, our internal master memes and networks will drift back and be suppressed by the larger networks of which we are a part. Other master memes have been proposed, but how do we know if they are truly master memes and if they are not themselves controlled by higher level master memes, like the 19 rings of power and Lord of the Rings being controlled by the One Ring. These are questions we need to ask to determine if a meme is a master meme at the top of a hierarchy. Does changing or introducing it make a sustainable difference, ignoring transient perturbations? Do many other memes change when it is changed or created? Can it interact with other master memes without being controlled by them? Last not all changes for the better, so we need to ask, does changing this meme result in, desi in a desirable change at another level? Sometimes memes are models of the world. They do not have to have a high accuracy in order to have a high fitness, though all else being equal, a more accurate model does have higher fitness than a less accurate one. There can be hierarchies of meme networks, but also more collaborative networks. Sometimes a master meme can be changed or replaced while working with the rest of the larger network of which it is a part. Sometimes a changed master meme does not affect the outcome one hoped for, either because one identified the wrong network, because it is a master meme but controlled by a higher level master meme, because it doesn't fit with a higher level network and can be outcompeted by an existing network, or because mimetic drift and lack of mimetic isolation. If the new or changed master meme is to be successful, it must outcompete these other networks. This may be possible, but there is also the enormous force of genetic or mimetic drift, which can swamp the new or mutated master meme or gene, and so isolation from competing networks needs to be achieved. In any case, Meme networks are controlled by master memes, not puppet masters. 
The belief in puppet masters as the cause of all ills is itself a meme. Actually, what one, one might the belief in puppet masters as the cause of all ills is itself a meme. Actually, what one might call a parasitic meme, which we'll explain later. It also is not a very accurate representation of reality, but accuracy is not correlated with fitness, especially when it comes to a parasitic meme. If you replace the puppet master by another person who pulls the same strings, the network doesn't change. Gandalf would be the same as Sauron after a while. So would Galadriel. To change the network, one must destroy or change the master memes, not the people who may or may not be puppet masters. Let's recap. We talked about all the obstacles to changing a species or a culture, or a gene or meme network, and the way nature and culture gets around them. Here is a summary of these obstacles in red and solutions in green, most of which we already talked about. The obstacles and solutions happen at different levels of organization. One thing which I should add about master memes is that changing a master meme does not change everything about a culture, no more than changing a master gene changes everything about a species. The philosopher Karl Popper thought that people who advocate big changes always want to throw everything else in the existing culture away and start from scratch. Such an approach is obviously unfruitful, however, changing a master meme does lead to large changes. Here is another way to summarize in green what is necessary for success in culture change, and in red what is cause for failure. Reproductive isolation is important for resisting cultural drift from the original culture. Change master memes are important for finding a downhill direction into a new valley either at a mountain pass, through a mountain, or from a change fitness landscape. We'll talk about this soon. And a sufficiently high mutation rate is important in fine-tuning along a downhill direction once it is found, or being ready for it when it arises. A selective pressure can be helpful with motivation to get out of a rut. I will tell you more about selective pressure in the next few slides. I want to talk now more about the details of macroevolution, also known as speciation. Recall the fitness landscape. The challenge of a small reproductively isolated population is to get into another valley. It can do this either by directly climbing over a mountain pass or tunneling through. The tunneling scenario means not having a phenotype for the new gene or meme network until one breaks through the mountain. It could mean building a lung while one still has gills and is mostly in the water. Going over the pass has to happen quickly, since one is less fit than the original population and can be outcompeted or simply die from hardship. Tunneling can happen more slowly, except that in reality there would be some loss of fitness in creating a new network, even if it has no phenotype yet, because resources have to be expended. The fossil record suggests relatively quick speciation events, consistent with both of these scenarios. In either case, a master gene has to mutate or be created, and in either case, the barrier can't be too high or too wide, or the new species will never make it over the pass or tunnel through the mountain before it dies out. The intelligent design objection of irreducible complexity holds in most directions, but not in the direction of a master gene or meme, as long as the mountain pass height or width are not too large. We've seen that master genes or memes are the way to a mountain pass in the fitness landscape, and that fitness barriers can't be too high or wide. In fact, they may sometimes disappear entirely. We have been assuming that this landscape is static, but in reality, the fitness landscape changes due to the environment changing, and a downhill path to another valley may appear. After the change, there is now a selective pressure to take advantage of the new downhill path that appeared. This could happen quickly and cataclysmically, as in a meteor hitting, a tsunami or earthquake striking, or it could happen slowly over eons. Then a mountain pass gets eroded down to connect one valley to another with a downhill path. I am speaking metaphorically about a multidimensional fitness landscape, but the cataclysmic effects can be literal. Because there are millions of directions to go in, this is still a sort of barrier. Through random mutations of a master gene or meme, one has to find the one right direction out of millions. This is called an entropic barrier, 
If there is sufficient genetic or mimetic diversity, there are many networks, silent phenotype or not, which can respond to this opportunity, and one of them might match the one downhill direction. One small reproductively isolated population with a new mutation goes into the new valley. A period of adaptation or microevolution follows for this new species, where it keeps going downhill, mutating any genes, not just master genes, gaining more fitness until it reaches the bottom of the new valley. Note that this is just an extreme case of the previous two scenarios of climbing to a mountain pass or tunneling through a mountain where the barrier height and width go to zero. Also note that the only time genetic diversity is useful is in finding a mountain pass or best tunneling direction, but only within the old species or culture. Once this master gene or mean is created, the new population must be unified. Going in other directions will be counterproductive and the average position of the population will not move at all or move in the wrong direction. Once the mountain pass or end of the tunnel is reached, it is still important for the incipient species to keep mutating genes in order to find the new valley, but in a unified way. And of course, once the new valley is found, genetic diversity is detrimental to staying in that valley, but is useful for finding another valley or adapting to um, a changed landscape. There is a bit more to say about selective pressure. So far, so far I have talked about selective pressure due to gradient in fitness. Such a force is conservative when a population is trying to get out of a valley with no downhill path, but is pro-speciation when a population has either made it to the mountain pass where a downhill direction becomes available from the valley. Now I want to introduce another kind of pro-speciation force without a gradient in actual fitness, but a gradient in what is relative to what used to be. Consider the possibility that the environment changes in such a way so that what may have been a valley has been raised up. Now there is a selective pressure to change without an actual gradient in fitness. I'm saying that under conditions of stress, a population can be motivated to find a mountain pass when no local downhill directions are available. This motivation may manifest as a higher mutation rate or literal migrations to new geographic environments. In the mimetic case, it may manifest itself as social and psychological unrest or malaise. With mimetics, wisdom and intelligence may help to see a bit into the future, so attempts are not totally random, as presumably happens in genetics. We might call it attempting change with mimetic engineering. Most directions of this attempted change will not be master means, that is, either toward a mountain pass or toward a new locally available downhill direction, and will fail. Most of these attempts at change will hit high internal barriers due to mismatch with existing networks. Most of them, even if they find the right master means, will fail because they will not achieve sufficient cultural isolation. But a few might succeed. Here are two historical examples. The first is the radical break from Jewish and Roman culture that Jesus made. With the help of several prophets before him, he identified several master means such as love and inner spiritual work. The early Christians achieved some cultural isolation, though perhaps not enough. Using the master means that Jesus replicated to them, they made it to a mountain pass. Unfortunately, with the adoption of Christianity by the Roman Empire, drift from the culture of empire caused most of the incipient culture to roll back into the valley of empire. The other example concerns the Anabaptists in Europe, who broke from the emergent emerging urban and oppressed peasant Protestant culture with some memes that had still survived from Jesus to form the European Amish. By moving to the U.S. and being allowed to keep to themselves, they manage enough cultural isolation to make it into another culture. This talk is almost over. Before I end, I wanted to warn about two things in culture change, also by analogy to nature. These are parasitic memes and invasive cultures. In a way, all genes, and especially memes, are parasites because they use our bodies and minds to propagate themselves. But most of the time there is a benefit to us, so perhaps we should call them symbiotes. 
A parasite, in contrast, benefits itself at the expense of its host. It is possible that by inhabiting its host it increases its but its host fitness is decreased. This is shown in the diagram for the example of industrial technology, which in my opinion is a parasitic meme. I think it is destroying our ecosystem and our souls, with some exceptions, but it has been exceptionally successful. The other problem with parasitic memes is that they often can fool people into thinking they are true or that they are master memes and waste precious energy for going in the direction of real master memes. Here are some examples of such parasitic memes which, even if they had some accuracy, are not, in my opinion, master memes. One has to perform the test suggested earlier to determine that these are master memes or not. I'll leave that exercise to the listener. Just like a parasitic gene can take over an organism or a species, and a parasitic meme can take over an individual or a culture, an invasive species can take over an ecosystem and an invasive culture can take over other cultures on the planet. Here is the main characteristic of an invasive species. It takes over other species, reducing ecological diversity, which ultimately hurts not only the other species but itself. A healthy ecosystem needs diversity. An example in the cultural domain is our mainstream culture of empire, which has essentially taken over the planet. There are very few surviving alternative cultures. With an invasive culture, there is no time to wait for the fitness landscape to change and provide a downhill direction. If it can't be stopped by other cultures, the change must come from within. Small, culturally isolated groups budding off from the invasive culture who find the right master memes to change. Here are master memes controlling meme networks which I would like to change, first in my own mind, but then in a meme incubator, also known as an intentional community. The first meme I would like to change is global industrial technology. Local, agrarian, craft-based production has existed before. Given what we have learned in science and technology, we may be able to improve it. I believe this meme network controls many sociological and psychological aspects of empire. The network consists of local materials, local energy, locally controlled but globally distributed information, and locally produced rituals. The idea is to empower people on a village scale to take care of themselves while removing incentives to go steal resources from other people. The open source movement, which started in software, is now spreading into manufacturing. We already have distributed information, so its production can happen locally everywhere. But much information relevant to production of goods is missing. We have distributed energy from the sun and wind, and to some extent we have distributed materials available cheaply from junkyards and recycling centers, although good land is still owned by a few. The other meme that I would like to see changed is the idea, essential to capitalism, that ownership of a resource by itself produces wealth for the owner, and that work is only for personal gain rather th than for expressing our highest gifts. I believe that this is a master meme, but one that can't change without other master memes also changing. In conclusion, I'd like to compare three strategies for culture change given the insights of this talk. The first is protest. It strikes out on all three necessary ingredients we have identified. It might be useful for creating solidarity among participants and adrenaline rush and an adrenaline rush, but it is useless for culture change. If it tries to change some master memes like economic power through say boycotts, that is another matter. But pure protest is useless for culture change. The second is reform, which most of the time does not identify master memes or achieve any amount of cultural isolation, and is therefore not very good for change either. The third is what can be called the utopian islands approach, which does well on cultural isolation and sometimes, but not always, on finding master memes, though often, often not so well on having sufficient mutation rate. Many intentional communities become dogmatic and set in their ways, not open to innovation this may be their downfall.